Hey everyone, welcome to the Amazing Astronomy Weekend with the National Museum Wales and welcome to Next Giant Leap. My name is Hugh James, I'm a science presenter and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, growing up I always loved astronomy and I think most people do love looking at the stars. Um, but I, I got my first telescope at the age of 11 off of QVC when QVC sold other things other than just jewellery um, and kind of made of a, a, a career out of it. So mixing that with my passion right now, which is exploration, I'm always really curious to find out what the next places are we going to explore in, the, in our solar system and then beyond as well. So I want to take you on a, a little bit of that journey. We'll have a 20-minute talk and then 20 minutes of a, of a star tour, see what's out there to explore in the night sky as well. Um, because we need to, to really start closer to home. We've got a lot to explore here. We've only actually explored 5% of our entire oceans. And there's still places on Earth, uh, on land, that we've not explored as well. And as the unfortunate fact of global warming starts to take, take hold, there's going to be places that were, have been lost under the ice that will become available to us to explore as well. So there's lots of things still to explore here on Earth. But maybe we can explore something the rest of the solar system at the same time. Um, so we can explore other planets while we're exploring ours. So we've got a bunch of planets to choose from, uh, some of which are go we're going to have to prioritize, which might be better than, than others. So right next to the sun, we've got Mercury, really hot in the daytime and really cold in the, n in the nighttime. Um, it's a weird little rocky planet, but even though it's closest to the sun, it's still not the hottest planet in our solar system. But we've got Mercury there, then we've got Venus after it. You know how this goes. You learned it in school. Mercury, Venus, Earth. M asteroid belt? No, not the asteroid belt. Mars, then the asteroid belt. And then we've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And we're going to go with Pluto as the last one as well. But there's also lots of other bodies, like that asteroid belt, in the solar system, um, comets that came in and out as well so lots of different things to, to discover and lots of places to explore but let's start um, right at the start uh, with Venus so Venus is a is a particularly peculiar place lots of weird things happen with it um, and until recently I'd have said that not much happens there it's got a runaway greenhouse effect it's the hottest place in the solar system because it has, uh, it's really high in pressure, really high in temperature, like the, the atmosphere is uh, acidic. So not a really nice place to, to visit. We have been there. Russian probes, when they, uh, Russian landers went there uh, in like the 70s and 80s and sent back a few images before the landers uh, kind of pressure melted. Um, it's not a very nice place to go to. So I was quite surprised when last, is it last year or the year before? It feels like last year, which was 20 years ago, um, there was some new research come out suggesting that maybe possibly there's some new signs, some bio signs, which could be signs of life in the clouds of Venus. Now, so many caveats to go, to go with this. The team, which is actually came from Cardiff University and a bunch of others, said that they can't actually find out what is left there to explain this phosphine on Venus if it's not if it's not life that's producing the phosphine. So it's definitely not aliens. Almost always, in fact, always until now, it's never been aliens. So we that's never the thing we jump to first. Um, but the team has said they've looked at the chemical processes and mechanical processes. How can this phosphine be on Venus unless it unless it's from unless it's a biosign, unless it's from life? And they've there have been other papers that come out suggest there's not as much phosphine there as, as once thought. So it's it's interesting and it's still up for for debate. But it's meant that people have been looking at Venus again as a possible place for exploration, as a possible place that we go back to and explore again. And the pure difficulty of doing it means that we, we send orbiters, we get a good look at, um, at the planet's surface, which again is weird that the whole planet's surface seems to have resurfaced about, resurfaced about 500 million years ago. We don't know why that is yet. So it's an interesting location, but because it's not easy to go there, we've opted to go to different places. So places like Mars. We've been going here for, for an awful long time. Um, we've been sending 
orbiters, we've been sending landers, the first images that we've been getting back from Mars, um, we're a bit sketchy. <laughs> Sometimes literally, we're a little bit sketchy. Um, and we just couldn't see what was on the surface. Led to a lot of speculation about what was actually there. But also, at the same time, these orbiters to begin with and, and, and the landers thereafter started to give us a bit of an insight onto into what this rocky planet was all about. And the more we found out, the more interesting it's been getting. And that's been ramping up in, in recent years as well. We've been finding more different signs of different things happening. We've been finding uh, from the orbiters uh, and the landers, like the, the Vikings that, that were sent there, we always were looking for signs of habitability. So we were looking for, could this place um, have hosted life in the past? Because Mars and Earth had a very similar kind of um, start out in the, the early solar system, but then they diverged into to what they, they would eventually become. Earth is a, a very much set up for life, or life, I suppose, is set up for, for Earth. And there's a bunch of reasons why why Mars is more hostile. I started my astronomy career looking at that probe, the Sojourner probe, the, the Pathfinder probe that ended up on just a, a microwave size rover that ended up on Mars. But we've been sending these remote control cars for a while now. Um, so that the most recent ones, uh, the the Curiosity, um, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, I still love these landings. Uh, and we've been doing it differently lately, but those landings are just nuts. Um, and everyone loves them. NASA celebrates better than almost anyone. This is the most recent one. I said we do it a bit differently now. This is Perseverance, um, which hasn't been on Mars that long. And the way that this one works is that it's, uh, it's autonomous. It got to Mars. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip forward a little bit because... Uh, such great footage. I'm going to skip forward a little bit because this is the, the full descent and down to the Martian surface. And you see that it gets closer and closer and closer. And the, the footage it's been sending back is incredible. So this is the parachute stage of Perseverance heading down to the, the Jezero crater. But as it gets closer, you start to see, pick out certain features of the Martian surface. Look at this. And then something strange happens. The the boosters kick in on the sky crane. And now the, the top the top left of this image uh, is looking back up towards the sky crane. The bottom left is looking down towards perseverance. And it's getting closer to the to the Martian surface until it gets down to around three miles an hour and it gets released and the sky crane moves off and away and perseverance is left. There he goes. Like that's on another planet. That is insane. Um, and of course, NASA go crazy because they always do. But with good reason that they just landed another over a ton's worth of, of rover on uh, the Martian surface. And what it's going to do there is something special. It's something that we've not really done before, which is look actually look for signs of life. Like I said, we up until now, we've really been looking for signs of habitability. Could Mars have once um, been habitable to life? And what Perseverance is going to be doing is it's landed in this, this big crater that is a, a lowland to begin with, which means that at some point in the past, when Mars and Earth are both very early on and Earth started generating life th um, around water, could Mars have been doing the same? So this whole crater would have been filled with water very early on and to the point where we know like the mechanics of it, you can see the stream coming down, opening up into this delta. Um, and it's the same way that it works on Earth. You get this delta, a kilometer across, that would have deposited materials in this big lake. So the Jezero crater is a really interesting place and the, the Perseverance rover will move across this to the delta to see what's there and then to the shoreline afterwards because we really, when, when we find life on Earth, where the the water and the shoreline meet is a really interesting location. So these this shoreline that runs across the, the side of the Jezero crater is going to be an interesting place for Perseverance to, to go and find out. And then it moves even further up towards the, towards the cliffs. So this is a an exciting rover 
purely because it's going to be looking for life. Like explicitly, we want to find signs of life. So this is the uh, the crater. The, the blue part is the lowlands. And then the, the green part is the, the upper. So you can see like how much this it would have been. You can imagine this kind of happening on Earth, right? That you get this. It, it was an impact crater to begin with. And then it just got flooded with the water because it's the, the lowest point. So this is what it would have looked like a long time ago. Um, so if we're going to find signs of life, one would bet that it would be somewhere around around here. And it's already sending back wonderful images, uh, the Perseverance rover, um, of what it's like on Mars, sounds of what it's like on Mars as well. It's going to be doing some, in some incredible stuff. Amazing photos, including the Milky Way from Mars. I'll just let that sit for a second. So as good as rovers are, there are a lot of geologists, a lot of people who say that an actual geologist could do the work a lot quicker, like a year's worth of work in just two or three days because you don't have to send signals. You don't have to have autonomous vehicles. Geologists could just do that. Um, and we've already tried it. Matt Damon's already gone. I hear it's going really, really well for him. Um, but how are we going to get more people to to Mars, the first people to Mars. And when is that going to be? Well, SpaceX have been already looking at, at this. They've been doing lots of um, tests lately, uh, including this is the, the SN10, serial number 10 rocket spoilers. It explodes shortly after landing. But they landed, this is a reusable rocket, uh, the Starship rocket that, that lands back, well, It'll be on the Martian surface, but here on the on the Earth surface, and it did do it successfully. Like it landed again, and even though it it spoilers it exploded, it's still a successful. Like failures in science are still successes if you get the data you need from it. So it landed about eight minutes later or something like that. Um, it did explode. It gave us some fireworks afterwards, but still a success. And the team at SpaceX have said that they're aiming for twenty twenty six. But possibly in 2024, they kind of have a window. You know, we have to wait for a window for Mars where we, we kind of catch up with it or we, we kind of line up and you can send off um, the rocket towards Mars. There's al always certain uh, windows uh, every 20 odd months, 24, 26 months that that happens on. And 2024, there'll be one. 2026, there'll be one. Depend on whether they're ready. It'll go in one of those. NASA has a, a different way. Um, of getting to Mars, they're looking a lot further into the future, and not trying to be necessarily the first, but you know, being the the one that they want to go there and set up camp, really. Um, so they're looking at how can we do that? What kind of missions do we need to run first? What do we need to test? What do we need to practice with? Includes the the International Space Station, the space launch systems as well, orbiters, landers. And then getting humans over to, to Mars at some point. I think it's around 2035 um, they're aiming at. Which seems like a good timeline to me. It's difficult to send people to Mars. One of the, the difficult things to do is to stop once you get to Mars. So they even looked for a while at having um, landers land on the, the moons. Uh, either Phobos or Deimos. Before landing then on Mars. To kind of break yourself into catching m the moon first. And then drop it onto Mars from there um so lots of things to think about before we end up putting humans on mars and mars is not a safe place to go to there's lots of risks going there so um i'm super excited to to watch at some point in my lifetime in the next decade or so next two decades someone land on on mars it's gonna be super exciting but that's not the the last place for us to explore in our solar system jupiter's out there to the the largest planet in our solar system and we've been getting some great images back from the juno spacecraft recently and galileo and all the all the other spacecraft that have been around jupiter and it's an interesting place but as with a lot of planets in our solar system it maybe isn't the one that we look to for life um, and that kind of exploration uh, there are real life scientists who say that maybe there's like jellyfish style creatures within the, the clouds of Jupiter. I'm going to um, veto that straight, <laughs> straight away for now. I'm always, I don't think that'll, that'll happen. What I'm more interested in is the moons of Jupiter. 
So somewhere like Europa, where you know the mechanics of of how things happen on Earth and where we find life, I want to say that are the mechanics that we're going to find life elsewhere in the solar system. So Europa, for example, one of the reasons I think is a great candidate to explore to find life is because it has more water around Europa than we currently have here on Earth, which is crazy. And wherever you find water, you normally find life. So going to explore the the oceans of Europa, and they are subsurface oceans, so they're under the crust. They are. We know that there's water there because of the we've s- the way that we've studied it in the gravitational um, pull of Jupiter on Europa and, and vice versa. It's kind of like if you've got a um, some water in a in a bottle and you move it from one place to the next, you feel like a tug in either direction if it's, there's a liquid there. And that's what we get in with, with Europa. We know there's a subsurface ocean. Um, we know it's really big. So what is under there? It could possibly be warm because of the... Um, Jupiter's pull on these moons is a little bit like a squash ball. Um, the way that you warm up a squash ball but is by squeezing it and rubbing it and... and um, rolling it under your foot sometimes. And that's what happens with these moons. They get tugged by the gravitational field of um, of Jupiter. So that means that it's possibly a subsurface ocean that's also warm, which would be incredible. So the they've got some missions going out to, to uh, Europa. I'd love to see at some point in my lifetime a human mission to go out and explore. I would volunteer, NASA, if you're listening, uh, to go to Europa to, to dive within the subsurface oceans a bit, but maybe like like we did with the early space missions, we should send animals first um, to to be the the test bed. I suppose it doesn't matter what kind of of, of animal. Uh, maybe a scuba diving dog could do really really well. Doesn't matter what breed it is either. I partial to a, a Labrador, so maybe send them. Or maybe maybe it should be a cat instead like scuba diving cats seem quite cool and let's face it they are normally uh, they normally look a little bit better in a wetsuit as well so i'm i'm putting my uh, my thoughts out there that a, a, a scuba diving cat on europa should be the way that we do it let's send robots first though the clipper mission is going in 2024 it'll take a while to get there so it won't be there for a while after that but we should know a little bit more then about what's under the subsurface what's under the surface in the subsurface ocean of Europa. I'm super excited for that uh, for that mission. And then we've got Saturn. Again, probably nothing in, in the clouds, but uh, the moons are really interesting, including Titan, which is my favorite moon in the solar system. Everyone should, should ha- have their favorite moon that they want to kind of get in there. Titan is mine. Um, that, and this is the Cassini-Huygens mission that's a uh, little bit on the underside of Cassini of the spacecraft is Huygens, and it was an ESA project, a European Space Agency project that worked. I'm super, super happy to, to say that. And as it's, the, the moon Titan is one of the only ones in the solar system with a, an atmosphere, and the only one with a thick, dense atmosphere. So as it descended through the atmosphere, we didn't know what, what it would find, and we found some of the same mechanics that you find on Mars and you still find on Earth. Those deltas, those uh, rivers and, and lakes. But we would say that it's similar mechanics throughout the entire solar system, but not necessarily the same chemistry. So the, the rivers and the lakes on Titan, and even the rain is in water, but it's um, things like methane and ethane. So in these places, it's the same mechanics, different chemistry. And the, the lakes that we find there, normally the, in the north, are really interesting and I really hope that we send a, a probe soon to explore all these uh, these lakes and find out, because it it seems like it was a very early Earth. Um, that's what it kind of seems like, that the chemistry there would have been like what Earth was like a very long time ago. So well worth exploring to find out how life came to be here on Earth. Then we've got Uranus and Neptune. Some really interesting moons again, but within themselves, maybe we don't. Uh, need to explore those in terms of trying to find life. Like this other interesting things, uh, Uranus orbits on its side, which is weird. Neptune has the, the highest wind speeds in the solar system. Again, that's pretty weird. 
But then one of the weirder places in the solar system was actually the place we didn't think we'd, we'd find anything interesting, and that's Pluto. So Pluto, um, we went there recently with the New Horizons probe, and we found much more than we thought we would. So we found um, that it actually shares an atmosphere with its sister moon, a sister, sister planet or moon. They kind of orbit around each other. This is Charon. And when we flew past it, when New Horizons flew past, it saw that it has mountain ranges and kind of glacier style um, areas as well. It has a very thin atmosphere that it shares. So much more than we thought we would find. And that continues to be the case all the way through the solar system. It continues to be that we we don't expect to find things and then we do. So whenever I say, like, let's not explore this place or maybe this should be the next giant leap, I'm always willing to be proven wrong because, you know, uh, it tends to happen that way with space. This is probably one of the, the best images you'll see for a while when it comes to space. Because this represents from one of the Voyager probes the the transmission signal from the thing we've sent out into the solar system that's furthest away. So this is a radio signal that is sent back and is still, and it will be for a long time, the the furthest thing we've sent away from, from planet Earth, which I think is amazing. And if we want to follow in its footsteps and go and explore different parts of the universe outside our solar system, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot because... The nearest star to Earth is a good four light years away, uh, Alpha Centauri A, and you know if we want to go and explore there, we need to move really quick, and it will probably be probably be inter intergenerational travel by that point. We'll normally have to go um, and be like Wall-E, my my favorite um, science fiction animation uh, of all time, where you have a big cruise ship that goes out into the into the universe, and you have lots of generations. Or um, cryonics, where you freeze people and wake them up down the line. It's going to be tough to do. Um, you have to come over radiation and muscular atrophy, where the, the muscles start to to, um, to wear away. You have to come up with, with the psychology, even going to, to Mars for, for eight months or, or so. Being in isolation, we've all <laughs> done it now for a, a little bit. It can be tough. Imagine being on a spacecraft going to Mars for eight months and how tough that would actually be as well. So we've got lots to um, to get over before we can go those places. And there are places to go to. We're finding new exoplanets all the time. Um, one we found quite lately, uh, uh, a really nice system of planets, a lot of which were Earth-like planets, Earth-sized planets, rocky ones, was the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is very similar in size to like a Jupiter-sized system. So a lot of those planets um, orbiting that star could be could hold signs of habitability. Is that difference between habitability and life? We don't know if it's it holds life, but could it be habitable for life? We're not too sure yet, and we're sending more space probes up all the time to to look out to those far reaches and and look at stars and find out if they are actually holding. Um, if they're in the, the Goldilocks zone, where you could potentially have water and life, um, the way we're looking for them is a, is a few different ways. But one of them is that we look at it, um, I look at the light that comes from that star over a period of time. And if it dips in light, um, in the brightness of the star, that means that there could be a, a planet there. We can actually look through if there's an atmosphere to the planet as well. We can actually look through that atmosphere and find out if there's actually different types of gases in them as well. So, again, like Venus, where we looked at a biosign, we could look for biosigns on other planets uh, as well. And to this day, we found lots and lots of planets. This is our solar system in the center of, uh, of this, uh, and the size of it. And then all the rest of the dots are all other planets that we found in different places around our, our universe. So uh, on the, the top left, there's the, a temperature scale. As you get further down towards the blue end, that's more Earth temperature. That's what we want. We don't want the lava end. We want the Earth end. And as it goes down from the big sizes to the smaller sizes, we want the, 
the earth size or maybe like twice the size of earth. That's, that's a good size for a planet to be. So all these dots then, some of them are orbiting really, really fast uh, around their, their parent star, um, which could mean that they're very, very close. And then some are orbiting a bit slower. Some are really big and really close. Some of them are small and close. There's a wide variety. But what we are finding is that there's lots and lots of Earth-like planets uh, out there in the solar, out there in the universe, um, in our galaxy. So when you look up into the night sky, then you should be looking at plenty and plenty of stars that could have planets going around them. So what I want to do next is just have a bit of a, a look at um, what we can see in the night sky at the moment, where we can see our own planets uh, out there at the moment, and really find out what you should be looking for in the night sky currently. Right. So if you go out and, and look north at the moment, this is what it'll look like. You might not be looking over water with a, a mountain there, but there's um, there should be stars in the night sky. I imagine it's cloudy right now. <laughs> right now. But this is what's up there uh, at the moment. So if we're going to look at what is out currently, um, let's have a look on the um, Sky Live. This is what we've got. Um, we've got a waxing gibbous at the moment in terms of a moon. That means that um, it's slowly getting bigger. A waxing gibbous gets bigger. A waning gibbous gets smaller. So that's heading up to a, towards a full moon at the moment. We're right in the middle of a, between a new moon and a, and a full moon. It's weird that a new moon isn't a full moon. It's the opposite way around. New moon is when, it's, when there's, you can't see any of it. Anyway, um, sun is getting... Uh, Longer in the sky is currently set in about half half past six, which is oh good, I like it. Um, we've got Venus that comes up just after the sun because it's an inferior planet. It's closer to the sun than we are. It means it always sticks very close, as does Mercury. Mars is up in the night sky at the moment. Jupiter and Saturn they they rise um, just before the sun does, and they set in the middle of the day, so we won't see those at the moment. So. That's what is up there in the night sky at the moment. If we really want to know what's up, we can go to Visible Tonight. This is a great app called Starwalk, um, by the way. There's a, a, a myriad of really cool astronomy uh, apps that you can get and programs for your computer. Stellarium is another great one. Um, but these really have made four years of an astronomy degree a bit useless. So we've got the moon that's, that's out. Mars is there too. Orion's a great constellation that's that's really visible in the, in the night sky. As we go into the summer months, that'll start not disappearing, but it'll be up during the day, so we don't see it. It's very much a win winter constellation. So all these constellations and all these stars are going to be visible to us uh, at the moment. So let's go and let's go and find a few. The whole night sky. You spend a bit of time looking at it. You notice a, a bunch of different things. You'll notice that some stars are brighter than others. You notice that some stars are different colors as well. Uh, you'll notice that some stars twinkle and st some stars don't. So you spend a bit of time looking up there and you'll definitely see satellites that whiz overhead. You'll see shooting stars. They happen all year round, not just um, during uh, meteor showers. In fact, we had one quite recently um, that landed, I'm pretty sure it was in Gloucester, uh, the the the. I think it was the Fireball Association of the UK. It was some, something like that. They, they found the, the meteorite that, that recently landed uh, in the UK. A meteor is what it is when it comes to our atmosphere. A meteorite when it, when it hits the ground. So there's always things coming through our atmosphere, and you'll see them as you look up to the night sky. Um, but I want to give you a bit of a roadmap around the night sky and so you can see you know your way around a little bit. The easiest way of doing that is to look north. Um, for, th for that, maybe get a compass. <laughs> um, a, a good way of finding north, though, if you can see different things in the night sky, is looking for an asterism that we know really well. And an asterism is, is part of a constellation that's just really obvious. And this part of the night sky is one that you might see that's really obvious. So go out and have a look around, and you'll see the plough. And the plough... Um, looks like this 
Um, it's an asterism there that is part of a larger constellation called Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. And it moves around. It's a circumpolar constellation, which means that it always stays in the north um, and it, it's always up. Because at the moment, this is actually now. So what I want to do is I'm going to move ahead uh, in a few hours to make it go dark. Because if I spin around quickly, what you should see is that, well, the sun is still up. Um, there it is. So we want to make that go down. We're going to move ahead just a few hours. There we go. To around half eight tonight. The moon is out. A bunch of stars. So you want to see. We want to find that asterism again, though. I'm going to head back towards the Big Dipper. The Milky Way looking wonderful. All right. So the Big Dipper's moved around a bit now. So now that it looks more like a kite, and in some um, does in some law, it is a kite or a a plow, a saucepan uh, in Wales. Um, it is a chariot to some people. So, but it's all part of the bigger constellation Ursa Major. So, if I bring up um, the lines that go in between these, then you'll see what I mean. There we go. It's Ursa Major, the Great Bear. So the asterism is actually just this part, the plow. There it is. And the top two stars on this, they're called Mirak and Dube. And they actually point to a really important star. And it's not the biggest star in the night sky, and it's not the, the brightest, but it's the most important to, to, to sailors and to, I still think, to us. So you take the distance between those two stars. There's very top two you can see on the screen. And you're going to take that distance five times to the left. And you wander over to this constellation here, which is Ursa Minor, with a little bit. And you end up at this star. And this star is called Polaris. It's not a massive star. It's not the, the brightest star or the biggest star. But if you stood on the, the North Pole and looked straight up in the night sky, that's the star that you would see. And because of that, if you head straight down from that star, what we should find is that north is there. There we go. So straight back up, and you head back to Polaris. So Polaris always sits above in the northern hemisphere. If you can find Polaris, you take a straight line down to the nearest piece of land, that's north. Always good to know. Um, that's how you find north. But also, if you go past, uh, th from this asterism, from the plough, past Polaris and out the other side, you get to another constellation, which is called Cepheus. So you start to build this roadmap around the night sky and you start to build a, um, a way of finding your way around. And starting at that one point and going, right, if I'm here, I can move to there, to there, to there, and I found my way around, um, is really helpful. Also, stories are really helpful for that. So Ursa Major, for example... The, the story of the Great Bay. And if we're talking about stories and, and fiction, I'm going to put up the larger pictures. So this is Ursa Major, the Great Bay. And Ursa Major is originally named with Callisto. And Callisto actually used to, to date Zeus, who is the god of all gods. And uh, Zeus and Callisto would have fun together and Zeus's wife Hera didn't like that too much in fact they actually had a son together called Arcus and when Hera found out she traveled to, to earth to have woods with Callisto uh, Zeus intervened and turned Callisto into a bear and sent her out into the forest and bones to Zeus Arcus was had already been born and turned out to be a great hunter, went into the forest and happened upon a bear that he was about to shoot. And Zeus intervened again, turned him into a bear, Ursa Minor, the little bear, took them both by the tail, swung them around his head and threw them into the night sky. Because on a lot of star, in a lot of star lore books and in a lot of places, you'll see that Ursa Major and Ursa Minor actually have a tail. A lot of people... In a lot of books, 
it won't be this way around with the head is towards the back of the plow or the, the, the lower side of the plow. That'll actually be the tail that he, f- he flew around, flung around and threw into the night sky. So a, a nice story that means that you'll, you'll remember that Ursa Major, the great bear, is also related to Ursa Minor, the little bear. And then out the other side, you get to Cepheus. And Cepheus was the king of Ethiopia. And he ruled over Ethiopia with his queen, Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is actually another asterism, which is the big W. Not the big W in terms in like Woolworths, but big W in terms of Cassiopeia. And these two used to rule over Ethiopia. And one day, um, Perseus was sending a sea monster to destroy Ethiopia. Because these two used to say that Andromeda, their daughter, was the most beautiful thing in the entire uh, universe, is Andromeda. So Perseus didn't, uh, sorry, um, uh, the god of the, the ocean uh, didn't like this very much and sent a sea monster called Cetus to destroy Ethiopia. They consulted the oracles, found out that um, pinning Andromeda to a rock was the best course of action. Um, did that for the sea monster Cetus to eat. On the way back from killing the Gorgon Medusa, Perseus, on the winged horse Pegasus, uh, and there it is with, with Medusa's um, head, with all the snakes coming out of it, swooped down, made a deal that um, if he saved Andromeda and killed the sea monster, that um, he could wed Andromeda, and uh, talk to um, Cepheus and um, Cassiopeia, they said yes, so he held up the, the the head of the Gorgon Medusa, turned Cetus to stone, the sea monster sank to the bottom of the ocean, and him and Andromeda, and I assume Pegasus, the winged horse, all uh, lived happily ever after. Uh, Pegasus is down there too. Uh, all lived happily ever after. So in this area, and the Andromeda galaxy is, um, is in there as well, um, in this area... All these constellations, there are around like seven or six, seven, eight of them in total that are to do with this story. The reason that, that we have these constellations is to know if something happens, what stars are in which district, which area of the night sky, which country of the night sky. And remembering these stories is just one great example um, of, of how we do that. Other things up there at the moment, like really worth um, noting. In fact, there's a up here. There's a, a a really great bunch of constellations and and interesting things. This is Taurus, the bull. You'll know that because it's a, a zodiac sign. The actual constellation has a triangle for a face. They're called the, the Hyades. That that const- that group of um, stars, big horns that go up. But then on the back of the bull, on the back of Taurus. There are these stars here as well. And these stars are the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Actually called the, the Subaru, uh, Subaru Cluster as well. If you look at a Subaru car, those are the cluster of stars that's on a, on a Subaru car. It used to be used as an ancient Roman eyesight test. And if you could see seven stars within these Seven Sisters, it said you had great eyesight and you could be part of the Roman army. I'm not sure why you wouldn't just say, I can't see... I can see like one star. My eye said it's terrible. I can't be part of this. Uh, also up, up there at the, at the moment, within Taurus is the planet Mars that we talked about. Um, so that is there. And a great way of, of knowing if it's a planet or if it's a, a star is that that song, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, is genuinely true. It's a science fact. Stars twinkle because they appear as one point of light because they're so far away. And planets, because they're a lot closer, they don't look like one point of light uh, and they um, and they don't twinkle. So if you're looking at an object and you're like, that looks really bright, I wonder what that thing is. Uh, it could be a star, but it also could be a planet if it's not twinkling at all. So there's your... Um, quick tour of the solar system in, in, in terms of where we should be exploring next. Um, wonderful things are happening around Mars uh, and wonderful things are happening in the rest of the solar system with us sending robots there. But in the next few decades, we are going to be going there, up into the stars uh, and further away. Our next giant leap will be the moon, will be Mars, 
but it won't be the end. The rest of the stars you see there in the night sky are all part of our galaxy. So we need to be exploring those too. And I often say that science isn't something that you can choose what you push forward. We all march forward in science at the same rate. So if you push one area, you have to push another. And space is just one of those ones that we've been pushing more and more and we'll continue to get better at. And then we'll we'll start to find that other parts of science get pulled along with it as well. So thank you very much for, for listening to our I will talk about the next giant leap. We're here for questions as well. So uh, right directly after this talk, we'll have our question session too. So get those questions in and I'll see you there.